We will switch to English now because uh, we will now start the presentation and the today's lesson. We have one hour and in this one hour today I would like to dive deeper into dependency injection and especially into certain topics how dependency injection is used to connect entity framework with ASP.NET Core. We have done many of the things that I'm going to show you today already in the exercises in the previous weeks but today I will go in much more details into how these things works how these things work behind the scene. Okay what I have prepared here is an empty ASP.NET Core web application, sorry, ASP.NET 5 web application, web API to be more specific. And in this web API, I would like to add a little bit of data access. I've prepared the necessary classes. We are going to use Entity Framework and then inject Entity Framework. And as I said, we will dive deeper into dependency injection. So. What I will do here is I will add a class and we'll call it data access. As I said, there is, it's not absolutely necessary that you follow along in details today. It's more about understanding the concept. I will give you the, my code after the lesson. You see, I have created a very, very simple data model. It's, it exists of a price class, which contains a product description and the product price, nothing special. I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Then I have a log class and this log class contains log entries and these log entries contain the username, the date time stamp, when was the log written and the description of the log. We can write any kind of log here. In order to make Entity Framework work with this project, I'm going to add the necessary NuGet package. I'm not uh, commenting that in any more details because you have learned about that and everybody should by now know that we have to add the Entity Framework SQL Server NuGet package. I will do that because I'm going to use SQL Server and also I'm going to add the design NuGet package. You have learned about that. Here it is. Nice. Then we need to add a bunch of usings. Nothing special here. Okay, using and good. Now we have data access. Nothing special here. Pretty simple. Any questions about that? No? Okay. I didn't expect questions regarding that because it's really, really simple. The next thing that I would like to do is I would like to register in the startup method here in the startup class in the configure services method. I would like to add the necessary uh, registration of our data context. And I have prepared this one again. I'm not going into any details because if you followed uh, the lessons, then you already know what I'm doing here. I'm using the add DB context here specifying the product context, which is exactly the context that you see here. Very, very simple. And that's it. Last but not least, we need to add the connection string to the app settings JSON. Let's do that. Here is the app settings JSON. And again, I've prepared that and we are done. Let's compile this guy. Good, it works. Let's go into the terminal and let's create the migrations. .NET EF migrations add initial migrations. Good. Ah, we get a warning because in the data model I have a decimal type and we should specify in real world the database data type for this decimal. But don't worry, that's not that's not important for today. That's perfectly fine. We'll just ignore this this warning for today's exercise. It's fine. The the it's standard behavior, the default behavior is perfectly fine for us. .NET EF database update in order to write the database. Let me quickly check. I think I have already prepared the database, but I would like to show you to prove that it really works. So I will delete the tables here. Let me do that. Oops, sorry. Here. Um, drop table logs. 
drop table prices, drop table EF migrations history. Good, tables are gone. And now we can do a database update and this should recreate the entire database. Again, a warning, but it looks good. Let's refresh it here and you see here we have our prices table, looks good. Here we have our logs table, looks good. And our migration history, whatever that is, that's an internal table of entity framework where it stores all the applied migrations. You don't need to understand that in detail now. It's just an internal system table of entity framework. It's enough if you understand that. Good, nice. That was nothing special. I just wanted to refresh your memory that whenever we add entity framework to an ASP.NET 5 application, we have to register the database context inside the configure services method. And what we do here is called dependency injection. Okay. This is what this uh, method is, is called. We are injecting the database context into the list of services, which is called a service collection. Here you see it. And whenever we create, for instance, um, a controller for the API, we can ask for the data context because we injected the data context centrally in this location into dependency injection. We have done that before. That was just a refresh. Now we are diving a little bit deeper. I would like to add a controller. Let's add a controller, API controller, empty. We have done that before. So again, nothing special. And I will call this the prices controller. This is our prices controller. In this prices controller, I would like to add an HTTP POST endpoint. Anybody knows? What is what is HTTP POST and why is POST here important? We had get, POST, put, patch, delete. What is POST? POST is used for, anybody an idea? Create, exactly, creating something, right. POST is for creating something. Put, patch is for updating, delete is for deleting and get is for reading data. And yeah, in this case, I'm going to use a POST request. Um, POST is somewhat special here, and we will talk about that in a second. Um, let me quickly write the method signature here. Uh, this is async, uh, async task of I action result. We have talked about that last week, price change, and we get um, a, special, a special class here. I would like to build a controller with which I can do a general price change. Imagine that you are working in a, uh, in a store and the store owner uh, just decides that all the prices should go down by 5% for, equal, for, for instance, or all the prices should go up by 2% or something like this. This is what this method should really do. And the parameters for the price change will come in through the HTTP body. Therefore, we need a so-called data transfer object. The data transfer object is just a class which is used for, as the name suggests, data transfer. It's just a class representing the input parameters for this method. So we will do a public record. Record is very, a very simple and convenient way to define a DTO. Price change DTO. Data transfer object. Okay. String user and decimal percentage price change. So we get in a parameter object, this one, and it contains the user who is initiating the price change and the percentage price change that we want. Okay, price change. Now, a small detail here. I told you that post is for creating things, inserting things. But in this case, we are changing something. We are really applying a change to all the products in the database. Remember, in the data access, we had the price table where we have the product and the price, and we want to iterate over all the products and change all the product prices. 
according to this parameter here. So why am I using post here and not, for instance, put or patch? I told you that put and patch are the correct methods for updating things, but now I'm using post. Well, what we are, what we are having here is a very special case for an HTTP web API. This very special case is just called an controller action. It's, it's like a remote procedure call. It's like a stored procedure in a database. It's not really updating a single record. It's also not inserting a single record. It's a more complicated, larger operation with a name, price change. And it does various changes to the database. It changes the prices, but it will also create here in data access a new record in log. So it's just a, a more complex operation that we apply on the database. And this operation consists of maybe inserts and updates and deletes and selects and whatever. And for such operations, again, they are often referred to as controller actions. We generally also use post. So POST is not just for creating a single record, it's also for calling a procedure and whatever this procedure does internally. Imagine, for instance, you build a web API for a cloud computing provider. You should provide a method with which somebody could restart a virtual machine in your data center. Which method? Put, patch, create, delete? You could say delete because it's rebooting. That's not really delete. Post, you're not creating a server or virtual machine. So that, that's not correct. Patch, do you do an update of the virtual machine because you would like to reboot it? No, it's just a general action. And for all of these things where it's not clear that we have an update, an insert, a delete, for all of those cases, you always use post. So post is for creating and for calling controller actions. And in our case, it is just like this, a controller action. Good. This is the first thing that I would like to do. Currently, I have not implemented this one, not implemented exception, so that we can go on in writing the necessary code. Additionally, I would like to add another HTTP post, this one. And this HTTP post is just fill with demo data. Okay, here we are really just creating records. So post is somewhat natural because post is creating and we are just creating records. We will just use this for filling up some demo data. That's all. Now, let's implement these two guys. In order to implement these two guys, we need the data context because otherwise we cannot access the database. Good, let's do that. We know already that we will add a constructor here and this constructor receives the data context, the product, product, data, product context. Let's store this guy. This product context is made available to our controller because in the startup method we have added the database context to dependency injection. That's not very new, we have done that before, but it's always important to understand how this works. So we repeat that. Here you see adding the data context. Here you see the controller. And because we have here the product context and here the product context, dependency injection makes sure that the controller gets access to the data context. Okay, good. We will need that knowledge in a second because in a second we will dive deeper into how this dependency injection really works. Good, let's add some demo data. Very, very simple, context.prices.com add new, we will add a new price here and the price is for the product, whatever, um, uh, apples. And the, the price should be, the product price should be, I don't know, 100. It, it doesn't matter. 
data doesn't matter. Uh, await context.save changes async and return. Uh, we want to add a, a status code created, but we don't want to play around with the location header that we discussed last time. So let's make our life simple. Status code. There is a, a method which is called status code. And here you can just say int HTTP status code dot created. This will not uh, create um, a location header. It will not return the, the, the object. It's just creating a 201 status code created. That's all. That's all we do here. Okay. Very, very, very simple. In real life, you should do, whenever you create something, you should do what we have done last week with all this, um, the, this, this open API specification and creating the location header and returning the created object. All what we have done last week applies. Today, we want to focus on something else. Therefore, I keep it very, very simple. But this is just because we are creating a prototype here, okay? Good. That looks nice. I think we should try that. Let's run. Let's compile this guy. Good. Let's run this guy. Good. And with that, I would like to try it. So I start here my Visual Studio code. Here it is. And I will create Come on request.http good and here we just say post https localhost 5001 api slash let's take a look the controller was called prices so we access it using prices whoops prices good the content type is json uh, by the way i'm using a plugin here did i tell you about this plugin before I do so many presentations, I sometimes forget that. If I didn't, the thing that I'm using here is the REST client. I think we discussed that before, right? The REST client. You can also use Postman if you prefer Postman. That's perfectly fine. And what should we add? Oh, we don't need any parameters. And we just want to say fill here because, oh, I forgot something. Here, we have to say route fill in order to identify this method again and with that everything should be fine and we can hopefully run this and we will get back here you see 201 created worked nicely and if i say select star from prices let's see good apples 100 thumbs up this is what i wanted to do good now this product context here was filled by dependency injection. Now we would like to implement the price change method. And now things are starting to get a little bit more complex. So now comes the new part. In this price change controller, I don't want to add the business logic for adding, for doing the price change. And I don't want to add the business logic for uh, writing something to the log. I would like to factor that out. I would like to put the business logic for the price change and the business logic for creating log entries into separate classes. In our very, very simple example here, it would be perfectly fine to put everything into this single method because it's just a prototype and we want to get things done and that's it. But in real world, imagine if this is a larger application, in real world, the, the controllers and the data context would be overloaded by many, 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 many methods. So you need a possibility to, to structure your application. And this is what we can do. We can just create classes, add class, and put the business logic in there. Let's add a price manager class and the goal of this price manager is to contain all methods all business logic methods which are related for price management this could be i don't know calculating the price in a different currency or in our case doing price changes 
percentage-based price changes. This is what the price manager should do. He's responsible for all the business logic regarding prices. Let's build this price manager. The price manager has a very simple method, public void change prices, decimal percentage price change. This is what this price manager should do. Throw new not implemented exception in order to make it compile. Now, the price manager obviously needs to access the database context because it needs to read all the products and it needs to update product by product. So how do we get an, an instance of the data context into our price manager? Well, the answer is simple. Again, we are using constructor injection exactly like we did in the controller. So again, just like in the controller, we are taking the product context here, this one, and putting it here. Let's store this product context in a field. Here it is. And now we can easily implement the price change. All we need to do is we need to make a for each loop and say var p in context.prices and inside of the loop, we just say p dot product price multiply equals percentage price change. That's all we have to do. That's the whole business logic. The point that I want to make here is that we use this constructor injection, not just in the controller here, but we are using constructor injection in any class that is used for building our application. Now, how do we get the product, the price manager in our controller? Because here we need to call the price manager. The answer is simple. Again, constructor injection. So what we do is we say, hey, dear dependency injection, give us the price manager. Let's call him PM. Okay. So we do exactly like with uh, entity framework, but this time with our own class, price manager. Then we can very simple here say price manager change prices, price change dot percentage price change. And now we are calling the business logic from inside of our controller. So we have nicely factored out, we have nicely built a business logic class which collects all the relevant business logic for managing prices. One thing is still missing because if you take a close look at this business logic, it does the necessary changes, but it does not store the changes to the database. So this is typically something that you do outside. So what you can do is you can say context.save changes async, something like this, uh, wait and we are good. Last thing, return, okay. Nice. Will this work? Answer, no. Why? Let's run it. Okay, server starts, looks good. But I told you it doesn't work. Let's see. Let's trigger a price change, okay? So let's do another post request, prices. And here we have two parameters. Let's check. The first parameter in the price change DTO is the user, user, that is foobar. And the second one is the percentage price change. I'm going to copy this property just to make sure that I don't mistype anything. Let's say we reduce prices by 10%. Let's call this guy. Boom, we get an error. This is what I expected. Unable to resolve service for type price manager. The problem that dependency injection has here is you said in the, in, in the controller's constructor, I need a price manager. But if we take a look at the startup code here, here in configure services, nobody tells the startup method that there is a price manager. This one, price manager, see that one? 
So we need to register the class for dependency injection. Services.add and now we have a problem. Because if I scroll down a little bit, um, there are multiple options that we would have. If I scroll here, then relevant for our cases is add scoped, add singleton, and add transient. We will talk about these three. Now, what is the difference? Add singleton, the first one, this one, would make sure that there is only a single price manager, a single instance of the price manager, the Highlander principle. I don't know, in, in your age, do you still know the movie Highlander? Do you still understand what I mean? Or is this movie so old that only old guys like me know what Highlander is? What about you? Do you know this movie? Is this something that is common knowledge? Never heard about it. Oh, you should, you should definitely look it up. I'm pretty sure it is somewhere available. I don't Netflix or whatever. Highlander. When I was young at your age, Highlander was a, a yeah, it was a, a classic film. Okay, you, you can take a look at it. It's it's really maybe strange because it's so old, but it's funny. Um, singleton means uh, that we only have a single instance, and in Highlander you had some heroes who were great sword fighters and they had to fight each other because at the end only a single Highlander, a single hero can can prevail. And this is why many people, and you will hear that uh, that often in talks, I think uh, uh, t tell you something about the Highlander principle because there is only one hero who can survive. Everybody else has to die. And singleton means there can only be one, only be one price manager and whoever asks for a price manager will always get another reference to the same instance of the price manager. There will never be a second price manager. That is single. Now what is transient? Transient is exactly the opposite. Transient means that whoever asks for a price manager will, ask, will get a new copy of the price manager. So whenever somebody says, give me a price manager, ASP.NET will new up a price manager, new price manager, and give a new copy to the requester. So you have many, many, many of these price managers. And what does scoped mean? This is the one we are primarily talking about today, and it's not that easy to understand. Add scoped means that everybody gets a single instance of the object if the requester is currently working on the same HTTP request. So if multiple people ask for a price manager, multiple people, multiple classes ask for a price manager, and they are all related to the same HTTP request, then they get the same price manager object. But if another HTTP request comes in and somebody else is asking for the price manager, somebody else related to a different HTTP request, then this guy will get a new instance of the price manager. That is add scoped. So what is your guess for our price manager? It will look like this new price manager new price manager, something like this. So what should be here? Transient, singleton, or scoped? In our case, what is your guess? Transient, let's try transient. Transient would mean that we get a new price manager every time somebody asks us for. We have to write it like that, price manager, something like this. Let's move it after the DB context. Order is not that important, but I think that's nice because the database context is added first and then the price manager, because if we take a look at the price manager, it receives the context is second. Okay, add transient. Let's try. Let's run this one. Good. And let's try our request. Woohoo, 200. Good. And 90. Nice. Works. Good. 
So your answer was kind of correct. Why do I say kind of? Well, be patient for another few minutes. What about singleton? If you would have said singleton, would that work too? You think so. Okay, let's give it a try. Boom. We had an exception and this exception was expected. What does it say? Some services, oops, some, oops, or ha, zooming. Some services are not able to be constructed. Cannot price manager, cannot consume scoped something. So no, the correct answer would have been, no, it does not work with singleton. But why? The answer is this one, add DB context. If we take a look at the price manager, the price manager requires a database context. So if there is a single price manager, Highlander principle, if there is a single price manager, there has also to be a single product context, a single database context, because the price manager needs a product context. And if we have only one price manager, there can only be one database context. And by now, until now, we have never discussed in details how many DB contexts we really have. We just say, hey, give us a product context, give us a DB context because we want to access the database. That's fine. But how does ASP.NET do its magic? Does it create a single product context? and give a single product context to us. It doesn't matter which HTTP request, we get always a single product context, obviously not. And that is what we have seen now. The point is that in this setup, there is one database context for each HTTP request. So let me quickly draw that. Imagine this, this here, is an HTTP request R1. Let's call it just R1, okay? HTTP request one. Then we have a second HTTP request and let's call this guy R2. The first request comes in from the user and this request will get his own or, the, or its own database context. So this one here, this one, is a database context, okay? Just this, this is a DB context. Uh, not, not very beautiful, but I think you get the point. And the second HTTP request will also get a scoped DB context. Here we get its, it, get its, it gets its own database context. And if we have a third request running at the same time here, the R3, guess what? This HTTP request gets again its own database context. And this is meant, yep. Yeah, I know, but you see me drawing, right? Yeah, whenever I draw, uh, the webcam is frozen. That's, that's normal. And if I remove the drawing, you will see me talking again, okay? But thank you for pointing that out. So you see, you get a database context for each request. And this is meant with scoped. This is scoped dependency injection. So the database context is added in a scoped way. And if we would now say with singleton that there is a single price manager across all the requests, we have a problem. Because there is not a single database context. It doesn't work. So whenever we work with a database, we need to add all the objects that consume the database context scoped because only then they can consume the scoped database context. So, scoped, scope, looks good. And if we run this guy, looks good. Let's go into our test call here. Let's call it, looks good. Let's take a look in the database and woohoo, we have another price, whoops, another price reduction by 10%. Nice. Now let's add, let's make it a little bit more complex and let's add another 
uh, manager. This time we are adding the log manager. Class log manager. And this log manager there will be very, very similar to our price manager. It has a constructor. Not hard to guess. The constructor gets our product context. Context. This context uh, or this method contains, uh, this class contains a single method public void add log and we get the user and we get the description and inside of here we just add this log so we say context.logs.add new uh, log and here we say user equals user and description equals description and uh, the last thing that we have is the log date time equals date time dot utc now we set it to the uh, current UTC time, universal time coordinates. So this is the Greenwich time. Nice. Very, very simple. So if we would like to consume this log manager inside of our prices controller, what do we do? That's a, a, a recap. Okay. Again, constructor injection, log manager, LM, store this guy in a field. Now we have the log manager and we can call the log manager here. Log manager dot add log price change user and let's add um, price prices changed by let's do it like this price change dot percentage price change multiplied by 100. Price is changed by this is a log record and at the end we save it. Get the point? We now have two business logic operations in two different classes. So we have a way of structuring our business logic into classes. And then we have a central safe changes async. Okay, let's go to startup. You will probably guess what I have to do now. I will have to services.add scoped log manager see that one now we have the price manager and the log manager and now you see something interesting i hope it is interesting the price controller this one the prices controller gets the context you see but the prices controller also needs the log manager let's put it here okay The log manager also receives the product context. See that one? And third one, we also have the price manager. Let's put it here. So we have all these. Uh, I have my screen is too small I think <laughs> let's see if we can get it here I would like to draw a little bit here I think it I think it will work yeah I think it will work like that you see the prices controller needs the product context the log manager needs the product context the price manager needs the product context and they will all be used inside of this controller method. So therefore, now we have the situation that we have a single web request price change. And in the context of this web request, multiple classes demand a product context. And scoped means that all of these three get the same instance of the product context as long as they work in the same HTTP request. If they are dealing with a separate web request, they will get separate product context. If they work in the same web request, they get the same product context. And I would like to debug that together with you. So I can show you a bunch of tricks that you might not already know from debugging Visual uh, debugging C Sharp code. Let's add a breakpoint here in the price change method, okay? And we will also add a breakpoint here in the constructor of the prices controller. Additionally, we go to the price manager and set a breakpoint here in the price manager constructor. And let's go in the log manager and add a breakpoint here in the log manager. 
Now, let's start debugging. The web server comes up and you see no breakpoint was hit. So currently, no controller, no ASP.NET controller has been created. The prices controllers constructor was never called until now. Now let's go and fire up a web request. Let's call this web request. Boom. With that, we should have hit a breakpoint. You see, this is the price manager. The price manager is the first object that has been created. And the price manager receives a database context. You see this one? Now comes an interesting feature, and I'm not sure if I've ever shown you that feature before. I think I have mentioned it, but I'm not perfectly sure, so I will repeat it. What you can do is you can mark this instance with an ID. So what you can say is you can say make object ID. If I do that, you will see here this dollar one. One is just the ID. And whenever, anywhere in the application, you have a reference to the same object, it will always have the tag dollar one. Okay, so we can detect whether two product contexts that we have in our application are the same object or whether we have two objects of the same class. Okay, so now we have $1. This is the first HTTP request. Let's continue running our application. Now we are in the constructor of the log manager. And if we take a look here in the context, you see, and that's the magic of scoped. Because we have dependency injection using with the scoped, with the add scoped, we now get the same, uh, same product context also in the log manager. If I continue running it here, we are now in the prices controller and guess what? It gets the same product context because it has exactly the same scope, the same HTTP request. So if we take a look at the price manager, you see, same context. If we take a look at the log manager, see, same context. So all these three now refer to the same product context. And that is important. That is really important because later on, when we do the price change, if you take a close look, we are here manipulating database context through the price manager. We are manipulating the database context through the log manager. And finally, in our controller, we are calling the safe changes method. It is important, it is super important that all these three components of our solution operate on the same data context because all of them make changes to the database and they have to work on the same context. Otherwise, bad things would happen. Otherwise, the changes of the price manager would be done to one data context and changes to the log would be done to another data context. And at the end, the safe changes would be done to a third data context and they, they have no connection. They wouldn't work together nothing would be written to the database because they work on completely different data contexts. It's super important that we have scoped data contexts. So let's run this through, it's fine. And now let's start a second HTTP request. Again, we are here at the price manager. And if we take a look, you see, now we don't have the dollar one here. We don't have the dollar one here we, because we, in this case, have a new HTTP request. We get a new scope. And so we get a new context. If I do, uh, where is it? Uh, sorry. If I here click on, come on, where, why can't I see my make object ID? Here it is, make object ID. If I take a look now, we have a new product context and it has the ID too. The same applies, context is now two, here context is now two, and here um, my price manager has the context two, my log manager has the context two, and my context is also the context two. So you see, when you have another HTTP request, another scope is opened, and dependency injection is done separately. Although we have multiple classes working together on a single HTTP request. 
This is the important thing here. Add transient works because a new instance is created whenever somebody asks for a log manager. Transient is more detailed than scoped and that's fine. Transient works with scoped, but it's not efficient. You don't need multiple log managers. So scoped would be better. Scoped obviously works. I've shown you that in the last few minutes, but singleton doesn't work because if you add singleton, then you have a conflict with the data context. It's super important that we have a scoped data context. Questions so far. Now, as a kind of closing before we stop today's lesson, I would like to enforce an error. I would like to show you what would happen if, for instance, the database context would be transient. Okay. What I do now is an experiment that you should never try. Don't try that at home. Bad things will happen. It's just for demonstration purposes. We are now doing a conscious mistake. Okay. Please don't forget that. Don't tell everybody. Mr. Stropek said you should do it like that. No, you should explicitly not do it like the thing, like, like the kind of, you should not do it. Like I will now do it. This is the correct setup. What we now do is we will break things. I have prepared my own factory. Can you remember? We have created database context factories before. So I'm creating here my own factory. Uh, I hope you can remember it. It's just a way of creating a database context manually. So with this factory, I am now able to remove this one, this add DB context and manually adding my product context through the factory. So let's create the factory var factory equals to uh, new product pro product uh, context factory. Here it is. And then we will say services dot add transient. This is wrong. I told you again, add transient new. Uh, let's add this one factory dot create DB context. So we will just add a DB context for each oh services. Uh, we don't need the services. We will add a new DB context for each. Uh, I did something wrong. Let me quickly. No, no, I did not. I have to wait. Now we will add a new DB context whenever somebody asks for a DB context. And now we will switch here to add transient, add transient to. This is wrong again. Okay. We just want to find out what's going to happen. Let's see if we still have our breakpoints. Here is the breakpoint. Yes. Log manager. Here is the breakpoint. Yes. Price manager. Here. Here is the breakpoint. Let's take a look in the database. We currently have a price of 72.90. Okay. Good. Let's run our app. Our broken app. Good. Let's send the request. We will hit the breakpoint. Price manager. Context. You see it here? Let's mark this context with an object ID. This has object ID one. Let's go on. Log manager context. Oh, no dollar one. You see by adding transient, I get a new product context. Every time I ask for the product context, I don't have a central product context for the, for the entire HTTP request. Let's add another object ID here. And third one, guess what? new product context. Now we have three different product context. Our product context is the ID three. The price managers product context is the ID one and the log managers product context is the ID two. So it seems that we have a product context, but in reality we have three. And now bad things will happen because the price change is now done on one of our product contexts. The log manager uses a different product context and the save changes a thing a sync uses the third product context. We don't get a mistake. It's 200 here, but guess what? If I if I run that one, nothing has changed. 
We don't get a mistake, but the database remains unchanged. And why is that the case? Because our business logic classes and our own controller class, they use separate data contexts and therefore everything is broken. Now, could we fix this? If we just add singleton here, would that be possible? Well, on the first view, yes. If I run a single HTTP request, it would work. But bad things would, would happen if multiple users would send multiple at HTTP requests at the same time, because then different controllers, different log managers, different price managers, they would all work on a single database context. And therefore, their writes and deletes and updates, they would be a big ball of mess. They would all operate on the same database context. They would all do transactions and call safe changes. And yeah, a lot of bad things would happen. So singleton is also wrong. Therefore, let's delete the wrong ones. Let's make it like that. And let's add, you can remember it, add scoped here. That is the correct option. And then we can also get rid of our factory. So that one looks pretty good. If we compile this guy, no, no errors, everything is good. Questions. What should you take away from this lesson? You should take away that you can build separate classes which contain business logic that belongs uh, content-wise together. We have a price manager for doing price-related things. We have a log manager for doing log-related things. And there are even more complex matters, more complex ways of structuring your app with Entity Framework. But this is a beginner course, so we will keep things rather simple. Maybe in the second semester we will see how we progress. So that structuring is important. You can always, when you structure it, access the same product context. And why is that the case? Because you have learned what scoped dependency injection is. Now you understand that scoped means you get a separate instance for each scope. And that is in a web server, a web request. Good. This is what I wanted to demonstrate today. And this is what I wanted you to remember. I hope that was okay. Last chance for questions. This was our last, I would say, regular lesson in this semester. Next week we have a lesson and definitely I will think about something um, hopefully interesting. Hopefully interesting. Next week we will do a thing which is not relevant for your exams. It will be just a, a fun and interesting experiment. Let's see, we will do a little bit of CI, CD, continuous integration and delivery with cloud computing and we'll take our ASP.NET stuff and put it into the cloud fully automatic. I will show you a bunch of experiments. I will show you how you can activate your, your own uh, cloud benefits that you get as a student. So next week will be a a relaxed lesson where we do some hopefully interesting experiments, but these experiments will not par be part of your last exam. So I hope we will have just, just some hours of, of fun programming that will be the content of next week. For today, I would like to say thank you for the first semester. Thank you for working, uh, for working with you. It was really great. Thank you for that. And yeah, see you next week and enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you for today. And with that, we close the lesson. Thank you. Goodbye.